Good morning. morning. Welcome to West Palm Beach. Only you live here. I got to travel down here. Um, I'm from Worcester, Massachusetts, which is about 45 minutes from Boston, originally from New York. and I've been, an educator all, I've been an educator all of my life. I decided when I was in sixth grade that I wanted to be an educator. And um, I've been in special education for, I was in special education long before my son was even born. And um, I knew very little about Tourette syndrome. And in fact, the day of his diagnosis, uh, I really didn't know very much. And now I've learned a great deal. First thing I want to share with you, I want you to take a look at this. Just read this for a moment. The part I want to highlight is this. I can be a tool of torture or an instrument of inspiration. I can humiliate or honor, hurt or heal. That's what educators, psychologists, mental health workers, you can be that person. You can be the person in a child's life that can change a child's life for the good or, for the, or not for good. And that's why we do these presentations. My colleagues and I all do these presentations because we believe in you. And we believe that when you have the information that you need, that you can really change the life of a child with Tourette's syndrome. Their lives sometimes are very, very difficult. I got into um, speaking on behalf of Tourette's syndrome because of my son, Eric. My son was diagnosed with Tourette's syndrome when he was 13. Um, It is a neurobiological disorder. At one time, it was thought to be a psychiatric disorder. It was thought to be bad parenting, uh, bad mothering. Of course, always blame the mother. Um, It is a neurobiological disorder. There is a genetic component to it. I I was fortunate enough last week, I was in Washington, D.C., speaking for the Council for Exceptional Children at a workshop, and a gentleman came up to me afterward who has two sons with Tourette. His father has Tourette. His brother has Tourette, and this man had OCD and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, which we'll talk about that comorbidity. It gives you a clue that there's certainly a genetic component. I've worked, had the, I've been fortunate enough to work with many families, and very often one child is diagnosed with Tourette, and several years later another child is diagnosed with Tourette. My son was diagnosed at the age of 13 with Tourette. Um, Actually, we started seeing symptoms when he was eight and didn't know it. We'll talk about why that was. My brother was diagnosed at the age of 51. I diagnosed him and then sent him to the doctor. (laughs) The most important quality about Tourette is that it's involuntary. And sometimes it's very hard to realize. When you look at some of the things that kids do and some of the things I'll talk about this morning, it's a little hard to believe that it's involuntary. I've seen kids do some things that, really? Involuntary? Yes. Many things can become tics, and we'll talk about that. Um, It's more common than one's thought, and the key to Tourette's syndrome is that it involves both motor tics and vocal tics. There are other types of tic disorders. There are motor tic disorders and vocal tic disorders. And you may have an Uncle Sam who has always had an eye blink, but never made any sounds. That would make it a um, motor tic disorder. And I've known people who've had you know, a throat clip <clears throat> all their lives. That's a vocal tick. Not a, that is not Tourette. In order to have a diagnosis of Tourette, you have to have both motor tics and vocal tics. Here's the interesting part. The symptoms vary so much from person to person. So the day of my son's diagnosis, I was sitting with the doctor, and um, he had examined my son, who had developed a very strong eye blink and a neck jerking tick. And I was at uh, the University of Massachusetts with the director of pediatric neurology. And he said to me, your son has Tourette syndrome. And I said, uh, what are you basing that diagnosis? He said, 27 years of experience. What do you do? I should have fired him that day, but that's OK. Um, I was so taken aback by that diagnosis because the the child in my high school that I knew who had Tourette looked entirely different from my son. I learned very quickly that Tourette is very individualized and symptoms vary greatly from person to person. So simple vocal tics, coughing, whistling, all kinds of things. So my um, my son was training for his bar mitzvah. 
he was 13 years old, the cantor, the woman who was training him for his bar mitzvah, called me one day and she said to me, would you please take this kid to a doctor? I said, why? She said, he's coughing all the time. I said, yeah, he just coughs. Well, he always had allergies, so I assumed that his cough was his allergy. His cough was a tick. It never went away. It didn't go away for a long time. Some of the more interesting things, one kind of tick, simple vocal tick is an animal noise. Eric has had a barking tick since the day he started with Tourette. Originally, it sounded like our dog, our dog Tigger. Tigger has long since passed on, unfortunately. Now he sounds, Eric's barking tick sounds exactly like his current dog. Throat clearing tick is very common. That's the one that my brother has, has had for a long time. All these different things. When Eric was little, when he was about eight, he had a, he had a um, sniffing, he sniffed a lot. But you know, he had allergies, so that's just what we assumed. Then there are the complex vocal tics. The one that you're most likely to have heard of is coprolalia. You do not need a diagnosis of coprolalia is what they call the, it's the infamous one. I remember reading the cover of a ladies magazine that said, women with the swearing tick, and I thought, oh no, not here we go again. Only 10 to 15% of people have coprolalia. Coprolalia is the utterance of socially unacceptable language. So I was at a Tourette workshop one day in a venue very much like this, and the gentleman at the lectern was bald. And someone from the back of the room yelled out, get hair. Well, OK, he wasn't swearing, but he was telling the person at the front of the room to get hair. Socially unacceptable language. That's part of coprolalia. Um, my son had some very interesting um, coprolalia. Uh, please excuse a little bit of the language. Um, when, actually, when he was diagnosed with Tourette, my first thought was, well, I, he was diagnosed on a Thursday. It was December 17, 1993. Not that that date was burned into my memory, but that was a Thursday. By Sunday, I knew two-thirds of what I know now about Tourette syndrome. And when I finished all the reading, I thought, oh, God, please, not coprolalia and not OCD. He had both. <laughs> so one day, my, my girlfriend was, um, I was in the high school, and uh, as an assistant principal, we, it was before we had our cell phones, um, my girlfriend would intercept a lot of phone calls for me, because my son tended to call a lot. And um, he would call, and she would answer the phone, and he would, please excuse my language, he would say to her, hello, bitch. And she would say, hi, Eric, what do you need? <laughs> and that's how she knew that he was on the telephone. Uh, it was a little bit unusual. And he had some other tics that were um, a, lot much more, a lot more colorful and longer, and we won't go into those. But they were very interesting. Speech atypicalities are also typical of Tourette's syndrome. One, an, an, another type of, first of all, another type of uh, complex vocal tic is echolalia where people will repeat what they've heard. So picking up accents is not unusual. Um, it's a speech act atypicality, unusual rhythms of speech, different kinds of, kinds of speech. So again, in order to have a diagnosis of Tourette, you also have to have simple motor tics. One of the most common motor tics that happens, and one of the first, is a simple eye blink. However, there's really nothing simple about an eye blink. So I'd like to do a little experiment with you. For five seconds, and I'll time you in a moment, I want you to blink your eyes for five seconds, starting now. OK, stop. How'd that feel? Somebody raise their hand. How did that feel? Yes. Annoying. Annoying. What else? Tiring. Tiring. What else? Dizzy. Dizzy. Now, imagine that you have a simple eye blink, and you blink your eyes maybe 30 times in a minute. Tell me what's going to happen to you educationally. What's going to happen to your reading? OK, somebody's going like this. Are you going to be able to focus? No. Are you going to be able to get any reading comprehension out of what you're reading? No. So the point of this exercise is, one of the simplest and most common um, motor tics is an eye blink. There is nothing simple about motor tics. 
The simplest can be one of the most complex. And there are many other types. Um, grimacing, nose twitching, that goes back to Eric's allergies when he was eight. That's why we didn't take him to the doctor. He was always scrunching up his face. We just assumed it was part of his allergies. Shoulder shrugs, arm, arm and head jerks. Then there are more complex motor tics, um, clapping, hopping, touching. Um, there was a, another colleague of mine told me about a young man who had a touching tick, and he would reach for women's breasts. <laughs> so the people in his school, the women walked around. This was an adaptation, and this is what we're going to talk about today. How do you adapt to different types of tics? The child is not the one in trouble. We need to find ways to adapt things. The women walked around with clipboards. If he was coming, they put a clipboard in front of them. It's a great adaptation. Um, all kinds of uh, different types of motor tics. Anything can become a motor tic. Um, Eric had one where he hopped for a while, uh, all different kinds of things. So the nature of tics is that they naturally wax and wane. So how many of you are teachers? Oh yes, most of you. So this is the great part about tics for teachers. They wax and wane, so they come and go. So as soon as you are really accustomed to know how to work with a tick, it's going to go away. And something else will take its place. Um, some ticks do stay for a long time. As I said, Eric's had the barking tick since he was 13, and now he's going to be 31. Um, they change in appearance and frequencies. They change in severity. And they do, for many people, they get worse during adolescence. The idea is that the brain chemistry mixes with the raging hormones, and things tend to get worse in adolescence. Um, so kids have a very difficult time. Just when they want to be the most accepted, the most like everybody else, they stand out the most because of their tics, which certainly exacerbates their situation. Tics can be suppressed for some periods of time. However, that's a double-edged sword. So when we ask a kid, to, if, we, if a student is suppressing his tics, it's like you trying to suppress a sneeze. What happens when you suppress a sneeze? Are you focusing on, it, on anything else? No, you're not. And eventually, that sneeze is going to come out. When a student is suppressed, trying to suppress his tics, which kids sometimes will do in school, if a child is trying to suppress his tics, what's going to happen is that he's not hearing you. Because so much psychic energy goes into suppressing those tics that he's really not paying attention and focusing. And it's also very, very tiring. Which is why we ask you not to ask kids to suppress their tics. Because it's very, very difficult for them to do. And then what happens is that when they get home, those tics explode. And they get home, the ticks explode, and they're very tired. And we'll talk about what happens in terms of then trying to do homework. We took, our, we took Eric. Um, we were fearless. We decided that one of the things that we decided was that Eric was going to live a normal life, as normal as we could make for him. So we took him to theater. We called. We, um, Boston, thankfully, gets a lot of the traveling uh, Broadway shows. And we were taking him to see Grease. So my husband called the general manager of the theater in Boston and said, we, our son has Tourette syndrome. He makes a lot of noises. We'd like to bring him to the show. Is there a problem with that? And the uh, general manager was fabulous. And he said, this is Greece. Who's going to hear him? <laughs> so we took him to see Greece. And he suppressed during the show, he suppressed his significant vocal tics. And I watched him during the whole show. He was like this. He was, he was moving because he was suppressing the vocal tics. It came out as motor tics. And during the intermission, we stepped out into the bal uh, off the balcony in sort of an exit way, and he just let loose with his barks and his noises, went back in, and we watched the rest of the show. He no longer goes to the movies. It's too hard for him. Thank God for Netflix and all the other things that you can get. Uh, it makes it much easier. So they can be suppressed for short periods of time, but you not, don't necessarily want to do that. Another factor about Tourette's that's not on here is that three times as many boys as girls have Tourette's syndrome, which I'm sure for many of you is not surprising because that goes along with ADHD and a lot of the comorbid conditions. Environmental factors play a significant impact, have a significant impact on Tourette's symptoms. Um, stress. So you're going to give a student a test, or they have to take, um, do you call it the FCAT? Yeah. yeah. They're going to take the FCATs. Watch that anxiety 
issue rise and stress. Fatigue, holidays. Um, a friend of mine had, two, had twins with Tourette's syndrome, and their tics were actually fairly low level. They had some of the comorbid conditions were more significant. So she and her husband took their kids to Disney World. What a great place to go. And suddenly their tics just burst, their, their motor and vocal tics just burst out. And she said, what did we ever think, we, what were we thinking taking them to Disney World? Because their tics, they were so excited. They weren't stressed, they were excited. So their tics got worse. So when you're planning, if you have a student with Tourette's syndrome and you're planning a great field trip, know that tics can get worse on that field trip from the excitement of going on the trip and also some of the anxiety of being in a new location, doing something different. My son's tics actually had gotten to a much lower level when he got to college. His first two years of college, his tics were much, much lower level. And then he developed a mono-like virus and his tics got significantly worse. That's the illness piece. And you wouldn't, I'm sure you wouldn't be surprised to hear that August, the Tourette Syndrome Association starts to field more calls in August and September than any other time of the year as kids and parents are gearing up to go back to school. They've had quiet summers and then the kid's anxiety level starts to raise as they're thinking about going to school and tics become more prominent. So there are many environmental factors that impact Tourette. So some of the strategies that we need to talk about. A safe place for, this, for the child to go when his tics are really severe. How many of you are school nurses? You're the best place to go. Either you or a school, psych school psychologist here? Thank you for being, thank you all for being here because it means that you care about these kids. Um, you're the kind of place, your, your offices, school psychologist, adjustment counselor, nurse's office, that's where we need to go for a safe place for a student with Tourette's syndrome, with tics, specifically with tics. Sending them out into the hall to let off their tics is not a good idea because then they disrupt all the other classes and it feels very uncomfortable for them. Going into the bathroom may or may not be a good idea because tics can echo if it's vocal tics. So it's better to have a, a better place to go. Um, reducing stressful situations, sometimes the cafeteria, different places that are crowded can be very stressful areas. Um, frequent breaks to allow them to have a natural place for movement if it's motor tics. Uh, preferential seating, this is always interesting. People always say, so yes, we should put them in the front of the room. No, do not put kids who are ticking in the front of the room. Why would that be? Everybody can see them. Preferential seating means that you as a teacher can have eye contact with the, with the student, that you can get to the student so that you can tap them on the shoulder, have a little bit of contact with them. We'll talk a little bit later about some other pieces around that. Preferential seating being second or third row by the door, um, probably not by a window because we'll talk about the ADHD piece if they have that as a comorbid condition, but just not in the front of the room but preferential seating so that you know where they are, they're close to you, and you can, you can be in eye contact with them. The single most important thing you can do for a child with Tourette syndrome, especially one with significant tics, is educate everybody in the school. Everybody. The kids, the staff, the custodians, the cafeteria workers, the bus drivers, the librarian, Everybody who's going to come into contact with this child, which means the entire staff, because as that child's walking down the hall, whether he's in elementary, middle of school, or high school, someone's going to encounter him. Imagine a teacher who does not know a child who has Tourette's syndrome, and the child's walking down the hall, and he's going, beep, beep. What's the teacher's assumption going to be? He's trying to be disruptive because he is being disruptive, but involuntarily. But for someone who doesn't know that it's Tourette's, the assumption is going to be, here's a wiseacre kid who's trying to disrupt my class. Teacher opens a door and says, cut it out. But if the teacher is educated, they'll know, oh, that must be the kid with Tourette. I'll let him be. Very, very, very important. 
TSA has a fabulous youth ambassador program. And I'm very proud to say that a young man that I started working with when he was in fourth grade um, in the district where I was for many years um, is now finishing his eighth grade year and he is Massachusetts Youth Ambassador and a really, really neat kid. Um, and most important thing is to find a way to make ticks irrelevant. Some other strategies, setting up a signal for kids to use when they need to leave the cl classroom. Um, you need to be a little careful with this because kids with Tourette syndrome are kids first. So what are they gonna do? They'll take a little bit of advantage sometimes. I remember working with a family who had a um, third grader whose best friend in the building was the custodian. I have to leave the room for a few minutes and he'd go find the custodian and he'd spend a half an hour with him. Um, that doesn't quite work. You have to be, keep that a little bit uh, balanced. Students with, with ticks, with significant ticks, Tourette syndrome, need untimed tests and uh, exams for all their subjects because their ticks, now some of the ticks we didn't talk about, some motor tick, a typical, fairly common motor tick is a finger tick. So they're trying to write their exam or even using a computer and their fingers are ticking. Well, when your fingers are ticking or moving, or your hand is jerking, or something else is moving, your, your whole body is moving, you're trying to take a test, and you're going like this. It's taking more time. They need untimed tests in order to be able to complete their work. It's really, really important. Um, leaving class early to go into a crowded hallway. Partly that's so that they have time to think about what, need, what they need to get from their locker. Uh, we'll talk later about black holes of lockers and, and uh, backpacks, uh, in order to be a little less stimulated. Building a schedule around the student's most productive time of the day. For some kids, it's early morning. Other kids, it's not the early morning because they've just taken their medication and they're drowsy. And they, their most productive time of the day may be starting at 10 o'clock. Most kids are pretty fried by the end of the day, however. Uh, accommodations for written work, shortened assignments, they may need a computer or a scribe. It's interesting to have the computer as part of the accommodations because computers are so common now. When my son was in fourth grade, we had to put that into his IEP because nobody was using computers. But that was his, uh, that was his accommodation for his homework. Of course, years later he told me, you know, Mom, you know how I did my spelling homework? Apple copy, apple copy. <laughs> um, adult support during unstructured time. Unstructured time is a, is a difficult time for kids with tics. We will talk about bullying both this, a little bit this morning and more in depth this afternoon. That unstructured time, cafeteria, playground, recess, 